Let's open our Bibles then to the first Psalm, Psalm 1. Um, I'm going to be reading Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 this morning, as well as another Psalm, if we can get into that. And uh, just before I, I, I read this Psalm, I should say to you that I discovered a while back there was always something between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 that kind of, uh, you know, there's just something about it because uh, they're so different. But I then discovered that uh, in ancient Israel, when they read the Psalms, they would read these Psalms together. They would read Psalm 1, then Psalm 2. So much so to the extent that they were regarded as one Psalm, one song altogether. And it is believed that both of the Psalms were written by David. That is the tradition anyway, although they're not titled that way. Um, And there are reasons for thinking that anyway, but... It's interesting because both psalms are completely different. The, the Psalm 1 is a psalm of personal devotion, which we'll see about, about personal devotion. And Psalm 2 is about the nations. And I've got the nations on my heart, brothers and sisters. And we all should, because we're commissioned to nations. Nations are our responsibility. We are about the serious business of nations. Um, and sadly, modern day Christianity, where as I said, you know, we're, we're inclined to sing Jesus is my boyfriend songs rather than worship. Um, and modern day Christianity has taken all the nations out of the equation altogether in so many places. And it's just become the four walls of church until Jesus comes and, and raptures us. Um, so, folks, we need to get back to the Bible and we need to get back to God's purpose for the nations. Amen. And God has a purpose for the nations, and he has a purpose for our nation. I'm speaking about Scotland, but I'm speaking about Great Britain, United Kingdom. He has a purpose for the British Isles, which we've been looking at in recent times. Let's get into this anyway. Blessed is the man. Now, it then says, blessed is the man that, and it tells us how the man is blessed, or how to be blessed. And we need to understand before we read this, that this is an old covenant scripture But we're in a new covenant dispensation, and we're already blessed. The Bible says uh, that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we're not trying to obtain blessings. We're not trying to get blessings. We're already blessed. But in order to walk in those blessings, you have to have consciousness of those blessings. Okay? Uh, let Let me write this down on my board this morning, because... And you know, some people get a wee bit freaked out when you use the word consciousness because they see that as a new age word. You know, oh, yeah, you have to, your consciousness. But consciousness, as used by the new age, is really just them hijacking what the Bible clearly tells us, which is that we have to have a God consciousness and a word of God consciousness. Um, what we would call it walking by faith, wouldn't we? So according to your faith, be unto you, the Bible says. But you could also say according to your consciousness, be unto you. Because if your consciousness, which is your inner man, is flooded with the word, flooded with God's word, with scripture, um, and with uh, the, the renewed mind and the mind of Christ, if your consciousness is flooded with these things, then you're functioning effectively as a believer. Uh, but if your consciousness is full of you know, the people's friend or EastEnders or all of that stuff, your latest Netflix binge, then um, you're not going to be conscious of God's Word. All right? So we need to be conscious of God's Word. Uh, And consciousness of God's Word will cleanse our inner man and fill our inner man with faith. Uh, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We could say it another way is that A faith consciousness is a consciousness that is continually and consistently being replenished and filled by the word of God. So blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And what that's telling us here is the influences on your life will have an impact on your consciousness. Influences. If you're Um, listening to ungodly people, the counsel of the ungodly 
is uh, sinners telling you, you know, what you should be doing or what you should be thinking or what you should be drinking or what you should be watching or what your activity should be. The counsel of the ungodly, who wants to listen to ungodly people? And the problem is, is, that, is that we have a society now that is listening to the counsel of the ungodly, which is woke ideology. Then it says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. In other words, you're positioning yourself among the sinners. Okay? Now, here's the thing, okay, that we, we like to talk about, and again, this is an old Christianity or churchianity tradition where we say, oh, Jesus is the friend of sinners. Because we think, well, that's Bible, the Bible says. But we don't understand that when the Bible calls, or the Bible refers to Jesus as the friend of sinners, it was a slur by those of his enemies. And what the friend of sinners, what they meant by it, and what was meant by it at the time, was that he hung out with sinners because he was one of them. Amen? Amen? Friend, of course, is not, doesn't mean what we think it means, mate, buddy, pal, China, whatever. It means a covenant partner, a covenant friend, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So the point being that uh, this, this term, the friend of sinners, what they were trying to say was that he, he is a sinner and that's why all the sinners are attracted to him. Okay? Now, Jesus is a friend to sinners, but not the friend of sinners. It's not being pedantic because you have to understand what was meant by those of his detractors. All right, so standing in the way of sinners means that you're one of them, okay? Or nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. It's interesting the scornful is, is a class here because that's what most people do, isn't it? They scorn and mock our faith, Amen. They scorn and mock our faith. But then it says, but his delight, this is the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, we would say today, in his word, or in the scriptures, he does meditate, yeah? Um, because there are more books of the Bible than there were back then. Now, now uh, at this point in time, if it was David that wrote that, or whoever wrote that, you probably find that these books, the, the, the five books were still really the only books of the Bible, certainly that had been collated, okay? And it says his delight. Now, here's the thing. When we talk about Bible meditation, all right, the, the key is not to meditate the Word, okay? Because if you say to someone, we need to meditate the Word, okay? And we all, we all know that, we all accept that, and so we start to meditate the word. But here's the key to meditating the word. His delight is in the law. His delight is in the word. Don't start meditating until you delight in it. Now, what I mean by that, again, is not, oh, whip up the emotions. If you don't have the emotions, don't bother. Delight, delighting in God's word is a choice, not an emotion, but it's a choice that will produce the emotion. Amen. Now again, this psalm is taught about personal devotion. A man of God, a man in his walk with God, your personal walk with God. And of course, that includes you ladies as well. Um, so it's not just, well, you know, if, you're, if you can only be blessed if you're a man. Amen. Uh, that's not true. Okay. Um, so it just means an individual. Okay. Uh, so ladies can do this. Ladies can meditate the word. Ladies should meditate the word. Uh, especially ladies should meditate, amen, because uh, you need uh, the, the help. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's just a married man's joke, okay? <laughs> His delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the word of God. And in his word, or in his law, does he meditate day and night? Now, day and night, um, that means... 24-7, doesn't it? Now, you, some people some will say, well, you know, uh, that, that's impossible. How can you possibly meditate God's word day and night? Well, let me ask you a question. How can you worry day and night? Because worry is meditating on fear, isn't it? Worry is focusing 
on the things that you're afraid of, and people can manage that day and night. Amen? So uh, there are means and strategies that you can meditate day and night. Um, so uh, it's possible. Okay, you just take a verse of scripture and just meditate it, speak it over and over. Anyway, I'm not going into the mechanics of it right now. I'm trying to show you something here that I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to see so vital today. What's this got to do with nations? Well, we'll see in a minute. And it says, And she shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Uh, Maria and her prayer mention fruit, fruitfulness. This is how you are fruitful as a Christian. The Bible makes it clear. By meditating the word. See, we sometimes think, oh, well, we go to church, we, we, we pray, and we do all kinds of uh, spiritual gymnastics, but then we don't see fruit. And the reason we don't see fruit is because we're not meditating. And you know what? I'll, I'll say this to you. The percentage of Christians who effectively and actively meditate the word is very, very small. That's why the church is in the condition it's in. Meditation, Bible meditation, uh, day and night, is the key to fruitfulness. I think it was D.L. Moody. I remember, I think it was D.L. Moody hearing this story more than once. That D.L. Moody says if it is time to live over again, he would spend less time in prayer, but more time in Bible meditation. Okay? And there's a sense, I believe, that when you're meditating the Word effectively and properly and appropriately, that's a form of prayer for me. Amen? Because you're communing with the Lord. You're communing with your own spirit. You're communing with the Holy Spirit. You're communing with God. And so if you're communing with God, that's prayer in my book. So he brings forth his fruit in the season. Look what it says. His leaf also shall not wither. In other words, you're, whatever you're doing for the Lord will not wither away. We've spoken about how revivals wither. Revivals wane. Revivals um, you know, they start off very strong, the Welsh Revival, the Lewis Revival, but then they begin to wane away, they begin to wither away, they begin to, I'm just checking my head again, it seems to be, oh, I've got a bit of blood there. Um, they, they wither away. Why? I think it's because people stop meditating the Word. People stop making the Word their focus. People stop making the Word their priority. Okay, and here's the thing about revival. I believe this, okay? Uh, and, and I think uh, listening to people who've been in revival, haven't been in a revival myself, I'll, I'll say this to you. You get so busy doing the work of God that you forget what brought the blessing. You forget to meditate. You forget to focus on the things. Does that make sense? Because you get so busy um, and busyness, and so you drift away from the things that brought the breakthrough, the blessing, whatever you want to call it. Now watch, it says here, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If you want prosperity, and I'm not just talking about having loads of money, I'm talking about for, for the things that you're doing to be blessed of God, um, whether it's your business, your job, your family life, whatever, then meditation is the key. Bible meditation is the key to all of that. Then it says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away, which really means they have no substance, they have no staying power. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You ever notice this, that backsliders and sinners don't come to church? Because they can't stand it. Amen? Then it says, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Don't jump from the way of the, the, the path of the righteous and onto the way of the ungodly, because that's the path that leads to perdition and destruction. Amen? If you've ever backslidden, you know that. Okay? I was a serial backslider, backslider for, for, for a number of years. Okay? I was good at backsliding. Okay? I was a very effective backslider. Um, when I was a younger Christian. You know, in and out, in and out, oh, oh, oh. And, and the thing about it is, is that you learn through time that backsliding always seems, if things are getting a bit tough, walking with the Lord, backsliding always seems the easy option until you discover that it's far from the easy option, it's destruction. Amen? So don't backslide, folks. Amen? <laughs> right, so that's a psalm about personal devotion, a great way to begin the book of Psalms, a great 
uh, great teaching that floods your consciousness with uh, God's word. Uh, don't let other influences come in. Just let the word of God renew your mind with God's word. All of these things backed up by other scriptures um, that talk about the renew of the mind, that talk about um, building up your faith and so on. So, but that's about personal devotion, isn't it? So why did the ancients, if you want to call them that, read Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 together? When we look at Psalm 2, which is a very famous psalm quoted, of course, in the New Testament, let's just read it. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That word heathen simply means nations. Why do the nations rage and the people imagine futility? What it really means is they're thinking about things that, what it really means is they're thinking about crazy stuff. That's what it means. They're absolutely insane in the things that they're planning and plotting. You look at this world right now, okay? And it just was discovered last week that Joe Biden had planned secret plans, and apparently they were so secret that he didn't commit them to electronics. He only had them in paper, but they discovered these plans, and the plans that Joe Biden had were to um, wage nuclear war on three fronts, America to wage nuclear war on three fronts. Think about that. The leader of the free world, so-called, is making plans for America to go to nuclear war with three, with three nations. I think it was Russia, of course, China, and I think the third one was Iran. Think about that. Is that not a vain thing? Is that not a futile thing? Is that not madness? Because who wins a nuclear war? Nobody wins. Well, well, you know, we, we, we killed uh, 100 million of them. They only killed 95 million of us. Think about it. But you see, that's, the Bible is always prophetic because when you open the Bible, if you open the Bible in 1724, in 1824, in 1924, in 1324, and not 2024, that the Bible would speak to you about the world that you lived in then. Because it speaks to us about the world we live in now. And it asks a question in Psalm 2. Why are the nations raging? In other words, why do they want to go to war? And why do the people uh, imagine a vain thing? Because I'll tell you right now, that word vain means futile and crazy. And here's the thing. To think that you can win or anyone can win a nuclear war is the, the most crazy th thing imaginable. And even if... None of their bombs landed on you and all your bombs landed on them and you won an outright victory. How can you say that's victory? How can you say it's victory to bomb and kill and, and, and maim and destroy nations and hundreds of millions of people? How can you say that's victory? How can you say that that's of God? Then it tells you, why, it asks the question, why do the nations rage? And it answers the question, the kings of the earth set themselves or position themselves, or they take up a stand. And here's the thing, folks. When you watch in the news and they say, oh, they're having a G12 summit or a G8 summit or whatever these summits, and they're having a Bilderberger and they're having all this, all these things, you say to you, what did they discuss at these things? The, Psalm 2 tells you what they discuss. And it tells you the reason that they meet, and it tells you the motive of their meeting. It tells you the spirit behind what they meet. The spirit behind the reason they meet. The spirit is very evidently set forth here. It says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. In other words, kings, rulers, uh, you know, secretary of state for defense, all these different rulers and governors and what we would call politicians. Politics is the counterfeit of the kingdom because the kingdom of God is peace, and these are, these are warmongers. Now, it's not popular. People don't like to face the fact that successive governments, Tory, Labour, yeah, it doesn't matter what they are, they're all warmongers. They'd all rather go to war than bring peace. And I don't mean peace as in appeasing uh, brutal dictators and so on. I don't mean that. But, the, but but to them, because you see, it's not them that will be in the trenches. And it's not them that will have the bombs rained on them. Because they'll be in the bunkers, folks. The rulers take counsel together. Some versions, maybe yours says, conspire together. So, oh, are you one of those conspiracy 
theorists, pastor. No, I'm a conspiracy realist because the Bible says there's a conspiracy. That take counsel together means to conspire together. There is a conspiracy. Oh, and, and what's it all about? What tells you? In the next few words of this verse, the kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel, conspire together against the Lord. Who knew? Who knew? Against God, against the Lord. In other words, the motive, the spirit behind them is against the Lord. And look what it says here. And against his anointed. Well, in other words, against the Christos. Antichristos. Antichrist. You see that? The conspiracy is an antichrist conspiracy. Well, isn't that what people have been saying? Of course. You don't need to watch YouTube videos to know this. It's a reality. It's a Bible truth, a biblical reality, that the reason the nations are in such a mess is that those at the highest level of leadership have a conspiracy going on, and behind it all is this. It's against God and against Christ. It's antichrist. Uh, we'll get to how that ties up with Psalm 1 in a minute. Okay? But you see, again, the ancients understood that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 went together. They, they had to go together. And there's a reason why they had to go together. There's a reason why your meditation of the Bible, your meditation of God's Word, when you get up in your house in the morning and it's cold and you put the fire on, you make yourself a wee coffee and you think, I'm going to grab, before I go to work, or I'm going to spend some time in God's Word, I'm going to meditate, as Pastor Bill says. There's a reason why that affects Psalm 2 which is on the international, the global stage, and his principalities and powers and governmental leaders and presidents and so on. What does your personal devotion, folks, here's the question I'll ask you. What does your personal walk with God, how does that impact things on the global scale? What does it have to do with it? And the answer, everything. And the one thing the devil does not want you to do. And that's why the devil will have us asleep in church, singing, you know, blessed assurance, as we sit in our blessed assurance. And not think about, oh, we, we don't think about these things. No, no, they're, they're too, we're just waiting for Jesus to come back and rapture us out of here because it's so bad. The reason why that spirit is abroad is because the devil doesn't want you to see that you're, personal walk with God is designed by God to impact the nations and impact the rulers and it, it does indeed and that's why when the rulers are walking in wickedness and they're unopposed and they can shut churches down and do what they like and, and treat the church with total disdain the reason they do that is because we let them okay so he's saying here why does it all happen why, why are things so bad why is the world in a mess why is the world in a mess is really what verse 1 is saying. And then he tells you because it causes those that are in control. The elite. Now I know there's people in, you can go into YouTube or you can listen to cranks. We've had umpteen cranks in here. And oh, it's this and it's that. And, it's, and, and I know there's a measure of truth in a lot of that. Okay. But there's, there's still a lot of crank talk in it all. Right. About, you know, and, and these people see you know, they see demons everywhere and ev there's no such thing as a, a righteous politician or a godly, you know, you understand, to them everyone's a conspiracy. And I, I'm not saying that, okay? But I'm saying the Bible says that there is one. And I'm not saying people don't get into politics with good intentions and motives, but very often those people are compromised or corrupted or both, and so they become ineffective for the kingdom. Okay? And that's just a reality. Okay, and that's something maybe sometimes they don't see, oh, I'll know, I'll know, I'll know, abandon my principles. And, and I think a lot of people that begin like that, they're the very first people that jettison their, their principles. Maybe because they're forced to, because they're, they're compromised. Now, but here's the thing, okay? The Bible makes it clear the nations are in a mess. 
because the kings of the earth, the rulers, the prime ministers, the presidents, the politicians, um, they have taken a stand against the Lord and against Christ. We would call that today woke ideology. Okay? The invention of hundreds of genders and all kinds of weird ideas. And you know what? Here's the thing. Much of it revolves around sex. Let's be honest. Okay? Much of it revolves around perversion. Okay? Um, but here's what they're saying. And this is the clue because what I believe the Holy Ghost wants us to see today. And this is the clue. You see, if you listen to what the devil says, or sorry, if you listen to what the enemy says, okay, you very often find out what's really going on and why it's going on. Remember how they sent the 12 spies into Israel, into the promised land, and 10 came back and says, we're but grasshoppers in their sight. But they, they didn't listen to what the giants and the people in the land, the fierce tribes were saying. They were terrified because they heard that the God who had brought Israel through the Red Sea, his people were coming in to invade the land. They were, they were scared, but they weren't listening to the enemy. And sometimes, folks, to understand God's purpose and understand truth and reality, sometimes you actually need to listen to what the devil's saying or the enemy's saying. And here's what these rulers are saying. You don't have to, well, why did he do these things? Why did he introduce these things? The Bible tells us there's a reason why woke ideology is being rammed down our throats right now. There's a reason why they're doing everything they can to compromise churches, close churches down, uh, destroy the salt and light influence of believers in the earth. And if we understand that, then we can take this nation for Jesus. As, as our understanding will, will help us strategize. And I want to tell you, the strategy is the simplest one of all. We've looked at it already. How do you take a nation for Jesus? The Bible tells us the reason we're not is because we don't. And I believe there's going to be a tipping point of people who suddenly wake up to this and realize, look, we've got it all wrong. And when they apply these Bible truths, we will see a nation, this nation. And just before I came out this morning, I watched this young man speaking about how he really believed Britain would again be a Christian nation. Well, amen. I'm amen in the guy. Just a young laddie. What are these people saying? The rulers of the earth, the kings of the earth, the rulers, they conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, what people are saying, in other words, the Bible reveals here what's in their heart. I want to know what's in Keir Starmer's heart. I want to know what's in John Swinney's heart. Amen? Now, I know that John Swinney, very often when he was whatever position he was before, he would very often be interviewed on TV in his home, I believe, or his office. I think it was his home. And behind him, a stack of Bibles and Christian books. Yeah, well, he must be a Christian then. Well, you know what? <laughs> Just because Watson's has got a lot of Bibles doesn't mean to say that the owner of Watson's a Christian. Amen? Just because you've got a stack of Bibles doesn't make you a believer. I want to know what's in his heart. And I don't have to ask him. I just read the Bible. Because it says, here's what they say, the anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's what rulers are saying. That's what kings of the earth, which just means those that govern us, that's what they're saying. They're saying, let's break these bonds, let's cast away these cords. What, what bonds? What cords? What on earth are they talking about? Well, if you're a believer, you'll know. If you know your Bible, you'll know. But what, what I like about this is the Bible is telling us very clearly, God is telling us through the psalmist here, he's telling us what these people are all about and why they do what they do, why we have in woke ideology. And incidentally, why did he want to go to war with Russia, China, Iran, and anybody else? There's a whole bunch of reasons for that. And some of it involves banking and uh, you know, all that. Anyway, but we're not going to go there. But they're saying, let's break these bonds and cat. Let's, let's get rid of these restraints. What restraints? 
Well, it's very simple. Then it says here, if we read on, let's break their bands asunder, cast away their cords, or let's remove the constraints. We're going to look at what those restraints are in a minute. Because there's an answer to this. And it's also in the book of Psalms. And when you see it, brothers and sisters, it ought to electrify you. Because here's what it really boils down to. We'll, we'll look at it in a minute. The wee man getting up in the morning, putting the wee fire on, getting his Bible out. The blessed man delighting in his word. Oh, I don't feel I'm being effective as a Christian, but I'll just obey what God said. I'll, I'll meditate the word. Your personal walk with God impacts the nations. That's the one thing the devil doesn't want you to understand. He wants you to think, as many people do think, and we've all thought, I've thought it, what good am I doing? How can I influence the great matters of state? You know, I'm just me and my wee house. You know, nobody knows me. I don't have any influence. No, I'm no one, I'm no one of the high hegens, as we would say. So how can I impact the nations? The very fact you're a Christian and you profess Jesus as Lord and you say that and you pray and you read your Bible and you meditate it in particular because meditation's key to this. In other words, what comes out of your mouth, it, it might never be heard in number 10 Downing Street. Keir Starmer might never hear you saying Jesus is Lord, but I want to tell you right now, every demon in the United Kingdom in the spirit realm hears you saying Jesus is Lord including the ones that control the Prime Minister's office. And the more of us that say it, and the more of us that meditate it, and the more of us that decree it and declare it, let me tell you right now, we will pull down demonic strongholds all over the UK, particularly in the offices of power. Now, I remember, you know, the Lord said to me, I want you to say and decree and declare, number 10 down the street will always be a house of prayer. I thought, I like that, Lord. I love that. Only you could have dreamed up that strategy. And so I began to decree it, and I began to declare it, and guess what? A Hindu moved in and had prayer to Hindu gods. And you think, oh, that's the total opposite of what you prayed. Yes, it is. But you understand, somebody heard that, somebody heard that decree. But I, I meant to Yahweh in the name of Jesus. And I want to tell you, I'm still decreeing that. Amen? So the point is this. The point is, is that it doesn't matter who hears you with human ears. Of course it matters. But if human ears of influence, you know, of, of, if, if rulers and leaders and government officials never hear you saying these things, Never hear you meditating the word. Never hear you praying. Never hear you singing Jesus is Lord. That doesn't matter because God hears it. And when he hears it, he dispatches the heavenly host. Why does he keep calling himself the Lord of hosts? Because he's trying to get our attention to say, I have innumerable company of angels, many of them warrior angels, many of them ministering angels. And as you speak my word and decree and declare and meditate, just meditating in your bedroom, I can release those angels. Amen? Well, I could sit down right now, but I won't. Praise God. Look at God's response to this in verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, shall have them in derision. God responds to the nutters running the nations. And they are nutters, aren't they? God's response is to laugh at them. And notice he's sitting in the heavens. We have, see, we, we, when we read things, when we put Sky News on and we see all that's going on, we, we start to paste. Oh, 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 what's going to happen? Oh, and we, maybe some of us have an idea that there's a conference in heaven and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're all saying, we never saw this coming. Oh, what do we do next? Holy Spirit, any ideas? Jesus, any ideas? Oh, Father, I, I, that's not what's happening. God's not pacing around wondering what's, what, what, you know, how to respond to what the devil's up to now or what uh, Egypt's are up to now. He's sitting, which means he, he's, he's comfortable and confident and, co and he's cozy and comfortable on the throne. 
We, like, we sing that song, don't we, that old uh, chorus, God is still on the throne. Amen? We sang it that week, she's saying. We sang it that week. Anyway, God is still on the throne. He's, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. And you know, the Bible says we're seated with him. So any pacing that we're doing, then that means that we had to get up off our heavenly throne where we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We had to get off that throne, allow fear to get us off the throne and start pacing and wondering and worrying and oh, what they're going to do if they put prices up, what we're going to do if, what we're going to do if this happens and that happens. And... Amen? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Which really means he's mocking them. Not in a petty way. And he's not really necessarily doing it for any other than our benefit. What he's really saying to you and I is, look, you don't need to worry about these people because I'm in control. But I want to say this to you. There's a measure, there's an, an element of this, and this is the whole point of this message that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring to us today, where God's not in control. We are. Amen. In other words, he's delegated it to us. He's delegated certain things to us. Uh, but he wants us to follow his example. See, Jesus is seated at God's right hand until his enemies be made his footstool. So I want to ask you a question. Who's going to make his enemies his footstool? And Because the, the Bible says, sit there at my right hand until... Amen? until your enemies become your footstool. So, now God's going to do it. It's only God's power. But he has to have an agency. He has to have an agent. He has to have someone that he will do it through. He's not just going to send thunderbolts from heaven and destroy all the world rulers. He's not going to do that. Amen? He, he, he co-labors with men, his people. He has given all authority to his ecclesia. So it's our job to co-labor with him, to be vessels of his power and glory and believe in speak. In other words, your mouth is involved in this. That's why, and see, the ancients understood that you think, well, blessed is the man. What's that got to do with the nations? Everything. Because if you don't have blessed men in nations speaking God's word, meditating the word, decreeing and declaring and praying and worshiping God, if you don't have somebody you know when the Bible speaks about a two-edged sword? It literally means two-mouthed. Dystoma means two-mouthed. And this, you say, well, oh, my Bible is a two-edged sword. No, it's not. Your Bible is not a two-edged sword. Okay, it's not. And we'll see that in a minute. Your Bible is a one-edged sword. Which means one mouth. Um... Let me just say that we've got Bibles lying around you. That Bible there is always lying there. It's always open. It's, I don't know if it's on for display. And that big one over there. But I don't use those Bibles really much. They're just there for... And you might have a Bible that you don't use much. It's maybe in your coffee table. Uh, and you don't open it. You see, God has released his mouth. Or his word through his mouth. So that's one age. That's one mouth. But it only becomes a two-edged or two-mouthed sword when you put it in yours. That's when it becomes effective. It's not effective sitting uh, beside your, on your bedside table. It's not. But when you pick it up and start saying God's word through your mouth, that's when it becomes a two-edged sword or a two-mouthed sword. All right. So, anyway, we'll see that in a minute. Now, uh, I need to press on with this, folks. Uh, then it says, verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. God is laughing until he's not. Amen? You, you know, even we do that. We could be in a good mood and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, I've had enough of this. No more good mood. Amen? Mothers will understand what I'm talking about. Am I right? Everything's funny until it's not. 
So he says, then after, after he's laughed, he says, then shall he speak unto them in his anger, his wrath, and vex him in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now I want you to understand something here. Okay? And you can only study this out. I know this applies to Jesus because the Bible tells us, the New Testament tells But the principle, or sorry, the, the primary meaning, the, sorry, the original meaning, is actually the Davidic throne in the earth. So David was actually saying this about himself. Okay? Because the Bible makes it very clear, Psalm 89 and other places, the highest instrument of dominion and authority on planet earth is the throne of David. But ultimately, the ultimate occupant of that throne will be Jesus. In other words, it's messianic, but the primary principle meaning when David wrote it was about him and his, and his descendant. It applied to Solomon too and other descendants. So what he's saying is God already has. You see, the, the, we always talk about the president of America. He's the leader of the free world. Then you've got the Pope. He's, you know, they all want to be the ultimate power. But David makes it clear, or the psalmist makes it clear, that God already has decided there's a, a throne on the earth. That's why Jesus isn't coming to sit in the Vatican, and he's not coming to sit in the White House, he's coming to sit in the throne of David. Okay, so it applies to Jesus. He says, I've set my king. Then he says, I will declare a decree. That's why I'm talking about decrees. Because the Bible says we need to make a decree. I will declare the decree. Oh, but we're praying. We're, we're interceding, pastor. We're praying. That's great. Keep, keep praying. But among you praying, do some decreeing. Because it's a decree that releases the will and purpose of God. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That applied to David. David was called God's firstborn. But of course, we know that it applies to Jesus. And we can apply it to Jesus in this new covenant era. Look what it says. Ask of me and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. The nations are Jesus' inheritance. Amen? So that's why we have to be about the serious business of nations. So how do we get the nations? By meditating the word. By declaring decrees, by interceding, by preaching, by proclamation, by prophesying. In other words, if you're not engaging your mouth in the serious business of nations, you're not about the serious business of nations. Or if you're saying stuff like, well, we don't really, nobody really listens to us, we don't have any influence. It's all the politicians. If you're saying junk like that, then you're not being biblical. He says, ask of me, declare the decree. Use your mouth. It's understood that people, uh, the blessed man uses his mouth to meditate. Meditation doesn't just mean sitting at the edge of your bed and muttering away. That's the mechanics of it. But what it really means is, is that you're using your mouth to bring restraints upon leaders. And we'll see that very clearly in a minute. All right? This might be one of the most important messages I've ever given here in the gallon. It says, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's verse 9. Verse 8, let's go back to it. The uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. The uttermost parts of the earth were understood by the ancients to be Ultima Thule or the British Isles. Did you know that? So, it's not just, oh, well, we apply these things in Britain in 2024. That's what, it, that's what they meant. And we need to understand the prophetic significance and symbolism of this, and we need to understand God's purpose for the British Isles in this generation. Then it says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. God has a message for Keir Starmer. God has a message for uh, President Biden and President Trump. God has a message for, uh, you know, the Prime Minister of European nations, uh, Australia. Be wise. In other words, we would call it wise up. Come on, wise up. What are you up to? 
That's the tone here. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. We've just got through reading that these are the people that have antichrist about them. So he says, look, you need, to, you need to stop that and be wise. What you're doing is not wise. It says, serve Yahweh, serve Jehovah, serve God the Father with fear and rejoice with trembling. Watch this. Kiss the Son. In other words, get to know Jesus and bow before him and kiss him and entreat him lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. In other words, they're saying, you only need to get him a little bit angry and you're destroyed. Your nation's destroyed, you're destroyed, and everything you're you're trying to do, well, God will destroy it because it's against him. Then it says, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Okay? So Psalm 2 is linked with Psalm 1 for the simple reason that the nations are in a mess, but the cure is already given us, which is in Psalm 1. Okay, so let me just say this to you tonight. Meditate God's word. And be about the, and delight in it. Why? Because that's the answer that God has for the problem of the nations. How are we going to avert nuclear war? Okay, we, we, we've got our ideas. Oh, so God will raise up mighty ministries and uh, so on. Well, maybe so. But, but I think that World War, sorry, World War Three. did I say World War One anyway? World War III will be averted, if it's averted, by people understanding that what you do in your bedroom, what you do driving down the street, the road in your car, is what God has purposed to bring about societal transformation. It's not that, oh, well, one day God is just going to lift you up and put you in the middle of the Houses of Parliament. That might happen. But you don't need to be in the Houses of Parliament to effect change. You simply need to be in the place of prayer. Turn with me to Psalm 149 and with the time we've got left, I want to show you this because, folks, this is the answer. This is linked to Psalm 2. The, the second Psalm and the second last Psalm are linked with Psalm 1 to show us. It's a triangle of, 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 of Psalms, if you like, to show us how God will bring about the transformation of the nations. I'm not saying these are the only scriptures that refer to this. Of course they're not. And in the gathering we look at one. But these particular psalms, Psalm 149 begins, Praise ye that the Lord, praise Jehovah. Sing unto Jehovah a new song and is praise in the congregation of saints. So in other words, when you're in here, sing. Amen? Uh, we, only, we only sang the one song today. But, you know, don't just see it as being, oh, well, you know, here's a singing part. It's too early in the morning. Singing is a big part of this. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion, are you a child of Zion this morning? Yes, you are. Be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Wonderful. Okay? He's talking about having church, having an assembly, having a congregation, singing, praising God, get, get all joyful. See, rejoice is a verb. Anyway, uh, here's where we want to go with this. Verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Or their couches or their beds. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, right, okay, have church, enjoy it. But even in your house. Even in your house. You don't have to go to Holyrood and be invited to speak. You don't have to go down to number 10 Downing Street and have a personal audience with Keir Starmer. You don't have to fly to Washington and speak to President Biden. I've got a word from the Lord for you, Mr. President. You're not going to get near him. God knows you're not going to get near him. Some people God will take and, and put and thrust in front of presidents. I was watching a, a program, Billy Graham, the other day, and he was with, with all the presidents. So God anointed him to do that. But you and I might ne- never ever get near these people. So, well, if yeah, that means that Billy Graham, uh, he'll get a reward that I can't get because I don't, I don't have uh, Keir Starmer's mobile number. I don't have John Swinney's email address. Folks, it's not about that. You have access 
to their boss. You can come boldly before the throne of grace to the one who is their uh, governor and ruler. Anyway, look, let's just read on. It says, let the saints be joyful glory, let them sing aloud upon their beds. In other words, here's an activity you can do at home. Okay? That's what this psalm says. You can do this in your bedroom. You can do this in your living room. You don't need to be in the offices of power. Just do it where you are. Look at this. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Be in whose mouth? The saints, the, the, the Christians, the believers. Not the pastors, not the apostles, the believers, the saints. of Are you a saint of God today? Mm -hmm. Then this is for you. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And that word high praises means a throaty yell or something that startles the enemy. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Folks, in your house, in your bedroom, in your... Now, if, if you live in a flat or, you know, there's people next door, don't scream and bawl and shout. <laughs> he's not really talking about the... He is talking about the volume, but he's not really saying, you know, be a nuisance to your neighbours. That's, that's not what he's saying here. Understand that. Let the saints... Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And watch this. And a two-edged sword in their hand. A two-mouthed sword in their hand. What he's saying is, as you're in your bedroom, lying in your bed, you're praising the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory, glory. I just read my Bible, Father. I just pull this out. And I see that there's a one-edged sword here. Well, I'm going to make it a two-edged sword right now because I'm going to say, Jesus is Lord over Scotland. And you think, oh, well, what, what, what good does that do? Don't listen to the devil. Because that's him asking that question, not you. Okay, Mr. Devil knows that when you say Jesus is Lord over Scotland, every demon in Scotland, every principality and power over Scotland of the kingdom of darkness just heard you saying that. And they saw the angels of God coming, released to make that reality. That's, and you have to believe that. You have to believe that, you know, it's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I just pray right now you release some boring angels over this nation right now. Because I declare and decree Jesus Christ as Lord. You've set him on high. You've, you've seated him at right hand of, of, of your majesty in, in heaven. He's over Scotland right now. He's Lord over Scotland. And I'm seated with him. And I release that reality upon this land of Scotland, upon these British Isles today, that Jesus is Lord. And Lord, just release angels to make that a reality. Wow, you just did more than the Labour Party will do in the next five years. In fact, you'll undo a lot of what the Labour Party will do in the next five years. Because a lot of what the Labour Party will do, as the Tories, is releasing hell on earth. And you just counteracted that. You have to believe it, brothers and sisters. Then it says, watch this, why would you do that? The high praise of God be in the mouth, a two mouth sword in their hand. That's your Bible, folks. Always have your Bible to hand. And look what it says. Why? Verse 7 to execute vengeance upon the nations and punishments upon the people. Now, I want to put that into a little bit of context. Don't want to spend a lot of time with this anymore. But it doesn't mean that you're casting thunderbolts down on folks. What it really means is that you're releasing the judgment of God in the earth. And God has already released his judgment upon Jesus on the cross, hasn't he? So what you're really doing is, when it says you're, you're executing uh, the judgment upon the people, what he's really saying is, is that people will become aware of the, their sins and the judgment for their sins were poured out on God's Son. Amen? Okay. And, but sometimes nations need rebuke, even in the new covenant. Anyway, but, but, but we don't have time to get into that. Watch this. This is the, the bit I want you to see. Verse 8. Because remember what back in Psalm 2, all these kings and nobles and rulers of the earth were saying, let's throw these bonds off. Let's get rid of these restraints. Look what it says. Verse 8. That the saints of God do to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. What he's saying here is, is that in Psalm 2, the restraints they want to throw off are the restraints you put upon them in your bedroom. 
in your private place of prayer, in your prayer closet. Uh, you know, wherever you go to pray, even this driving down the road, Father in Jesus' name, bring, let, let Jesus. Let, let, how do you put a, how do you put restraints upon rulers? Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. You just slapped a big chain upon woke ideology rulers. Amen. And God sent myriads of angels. To, how's he going to do it? Well, that's his business. Our business is just to release it. And keep releasing it. And keep releasing it. And keep speaking it. And keep declaring the decree. This land of Scotland belongs to Jesus. Jesus is Lord of Scotland. He's Lord over Scotland. He's Lord in Scotland. And you saying that will make it so. But I want to say this to you. Very few people are actually doing that, aren't they? Most people are praying, get me out of here, Lord, send the rapture. My bags are packed. I can't take it anymore, Jesus. Come on. Anyway. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. Okay? In other words, God has a judgment set up for people who want to pervert and defile our children. Amen? Who want to bring our people into bondage. Who want to destroy nations by sending them into needless wars and all kinds of things. And communists and all these people. Okay? God has judgment set aside for them. And your words released will bring that judgment. And then it says, okay, this honor have all the pastors and leaders and apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Oh, well, that's a job for the pastors. That's above my pay grade as a believer. It doesn't say that. This honor have all his saints. If you're a saint, this privilege to bring societal transformation, not by standing outside the council office or going down to number 10 down the street with your placard. We've all known the placard carrying folks who were well-intentioned, some of them. We've all known that way of, oh, let's protest. We're having a protest. Do you want to join us? No, I don't. Because you just look like a fool. Nobody's listening. And you actually reinforce the stereotypes that they think you're nuts. Okay, but you can do your protest at the throne of God. Okay. And you don't even need to get up to do it. You're seated next to him. Say, Lord, I don't like this business that's going on. The Lord's not going to say, well, beg, beg, squall, ball. No, he's going to say this. Well, declare the decree. And so, folks, the ability the power to change things in the nations, in our nation, in the city of Glasgow, where you live, in your community. That power, that ability, God has already given you the authority. He's already given you, I've equipped you. We looked at it, was it last week we looked at it? He's given you his word. He's given you the Holy Ghost. And all you have to do is open your mouth and speak what he said in his word. And that is a bind, that is a restraint, that is a cord, that is a, a fetter upon wicked. And they are wicked. Some of these rulers are wicked. Some of them are just deceived. But many of them are outright wicked. And it puts a cord on them. And it lets, it, you know, we can protest all we want. And if we had majority and so on, and we could beat them at the ballot box. But here's the thing. If you, what do you do if you can't beat them at the ballot box? What do you do in a democracy if there aren't enough of us? To vote them out. How do you get rid of them? Well, how do we get rid of some of them that we've already got rid of? And we all know who we're talking about. At the place of prayer. At the place... And, and we, we did it in our own bedrooms. We did it in our own living rooms. Which, yes, we did it in meetings, public meetings, we said it. But, you know, we all went about saying... I rem I, do you remember the meetings that we used to have with Stevie and Emma? We, we would just meet and we would just say, yeah. very matter of fact, where are we going to go for some eat? And it was almost like, well, before we do that, let's just take care of business. And the things that we said, which didn't take long, 
before we went for a nice bite, bite of lunch, everything we said came to pass. Everything. And when we said it, was it they were at the zenith and height of their power. Folks, the power, the authority, is not with the Lord. He ultimately, of course, has that power and authority, but he's delegated it to us. That's the key thing. Okay? If, if we go away um, and leave the, the kids and say to the girls, David's in charge, <laughs> we don't do that. But if we did, you understand, delegated authority is authority. And he's delegated his authority to us. And here, in these verses that we've looked at, he tells us how to exercise that. Okay? He tells us that the things that they're trying to throw off and that's why they have all these summits and meetings and, you know, all these crazy things that they get up to. The reason they have them is because they're trying to do, throw off the power of the church. That's why they closed this down four years ago. Because they knew this day was coming. When people would... They tried to avert it, I believe. This revelation was starting to come forth. Anyway, let's now have a time of uh, seeking and praying the Lord to the Lord just to really cement what we've heard today. Amen. In the time we've got left.